Father, we ask you for your blessing. We ask you, Lord, for impartation of your heart. In the name of Jesus. This will be a little bit different than the other ones. The other ones I focused mostly on supernatural events. I'm going to talk about one. But it has so much weight of importance to who we are that if we miss this one, then all the other promises are lost or at least diminished. And this is where my concern is most upon what I'm going to share in this one. So I'm going to share the experience. I'm going to break it down a little bit as what it means to us because all the other promises are related to how we respond. Paragraph A. This session focuses on heart responses that the Lord requires. Now it's the heart responses He requires when He entrusts a greater measure of the Spirit. Now, he wants the heart responses from everybody no matter what, but when he entrusts a greater measure, he requires it. Because a greater measure causes, well, the Lord visits with greater consequences, positive and negative, when he entrusts more. We have to have a faithful heart, but it's not only a faithful heart in terms of obedience and humility. We have to have a fearless heart. Because there's a God-orchestrated stigma upon the anointing of the Holy Spirit. A lot of folks, they think revival, they think, wow, power, excitement. Beloved, revival is power and excitement. It is stigma. A lot of folks that are thinking of the promises are only thinking of the positive and the excitement. There is a huge downside. Because as my friend Francis Frangipan has said so often... New levels, new devils. If there's new levels of power, there are new levels of attack. New levels bring new devils. And I find that the most challenging aspect of a move of God, I believe, is not going to be the dedication. It's going to be the bearing of reproach, the bearing of the stigma. And I would say as well, The attitude we have towards others. Others that are different in the body of Christ and others that mistreat us. We have to have a different attitude. Paragraph B, in the God-orchestrated stigma that we're going to look at in a minute. I think the fear of man is more challenging than a dedication to the fasted lifestyle. I think it's easier to live the fasted lifestyle and yield to the fear of man It's more likely. A lot of people pray and fast, but they yield to the fear of man. So don't think because we've said yes to prayer and fasting that it's over. We've got it made. It's done. Roman numeral 2. What the Holy Spirit did on the day of Pentecost is a pattern of what He will do in many places in the end times. You can read the verse from Acts 2 on your own, but on the day of Pentecost there was wind... Fire, wine. Three different distinct manifestations of the Spirit. And of course, those are whole categories of Holy Spirit activity. B, the wind speaks of the supernatural realm, the realm where the angels are actively involved. The buildings are shaking. The creative miracles. The fire speaks of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that heart-wrenching Conviction of repentance and that impassioned love for Jesus, that burning heart. The wine speaks of the healing, restoring of the heart, making the heart glad, the joy of the Lord. It's important to understand that as we go into this next experience with the Lord. Roman numeral three. It's one that we talk about, we use the phrase Joseph's dungeon. When Bob Jones saw Joseph's dungeon. Now, this is one year later, after the May 83 solemn assembly. So we have fasted and prayed in May 83. And remember, at the end of the fast, Bob Jones got up and said, the spiritual drought that's on our nation is not going to lift right now. There will be, you know, there's pockets of the blessing of God here, there, always. But he said, the spiritual drought is not lifting right now. In other words, the full revival we're believing for. So... For the last year, May, June, July, August, all the way, I've been asking one main question, when? 
When? Lord, is the drought breaking this month? I'm thinking more in months, not in years. And the Lord's thinking more of decades, not even years. I'm thinking months. The Lord's thinking decades. Lord, is it this month the drought breaks? That was the predominant question I had. Paragraph B. On a Saturday morning in April 1984. I remember this just like it was yesterday. I'm wide awake in the morning. Laying on my bed. Getting ready to go to the Saturday morning prayer meeting. And just suddenly, I guess it always happens suddenly. That's just how it is. The thunderous audible voice of God. I'm wide awake. This is not a dream, not a vision, not a trance. Audible voice. Thunder. The Lord says, I have a revelation for you. Call Bob Jones. This, I absolutely am telling you what he said. That is so odd. I, I didn't concern myself with that in that moment because it was thunderous. It was like it came from 20 miles away. And it and it's like it came in stereo right out of my belly from the Holy Spirit. I don't understand. It felt like it came right out here. And from 20 miles away, it was the strangest sound of power and authority. And I mean my being shook when this happened. I have a revelation for you. That is the phrase. Beloved, if God speaks audibly, and he was to this movement, not just to me personally, this is a revelation we must take very, very seriously. This is a very important. God speaks thunderous from heaven to our movement. I have a revelation for you. This is worthy of a whole session to pay attention to this revelation. Of the eight sessions, this is the only one that I'm going to talk more in a practical heart response rather than just story after story after story. He said, call Bob Jones. Again, that doesn't even strike me as odd that he didn't just tell me, well, Lord, we're talking. Here we are. Just tell me. You will tell it much better than Bob Jones will. That never struck my mind because the audible voice of God shakes your being. You, it takes a while to recover from that. You don't get your sense of humor or your wit back for quite a while. I talked to Bob a couple hours later. Telephone. He says, Mike, I had an absolutely astounding experience this morning. And the Lord wants me to tell it to you. I said, I'm sure of that, Bob. He said, I went in the visions to Joseph's dungeon. And, you know, I went in the visions. You know, this is just different language. They go, you know, dream, vision. No, I was there. Okay. He said, I saw the two men that were representative of the two ministries in the body of Christ. Even right now, two ministries in the body of Christ. But the message is for yet to come. The, the, the weight of this message is yet future. Though it had a very important present tense application 25 years ago. I saw two men. And they represent the two types of ministries. And you can read the Genesis 40 account on your own. And the story of Joseph. Joseph is in dungeon, in the dungeon. There's a cupbearer. And a cupbearer serves the wine to the king, right? That's what a cupbearer does. And the baker. And the baker makes the bread for the king's family. Both of them were being accused of putting poison in their service. And if you put poison in the bread and served it to the king, you were executed. Because you're trying to kill the king's family. If you put poison in the king's wine, that's really serious offense. Paragraph C, top of page 2. If you read the Genesis 40 story... And it went along with, I mean, Bob's experience, his visionary experience went along with the actual storyline in Genesis 40. One man was proved guilty. The baker, he was put to death. The second man was proved innocent, the cupbearer, and he was released out of prison. And in the vision, the bread spoke of the ministry of the word. Now, the ministry of the word is not 
just preaching. A lot of folks think of ministry of the word preaching. Beloved, it is singing. It is writing. It is drama. It is testimony. It is now in these days blogs and podcasts and emails. I mean, with the technology going on, a person can have a powerful ministry of communicating the heart of God, the Word of God, without having, quote, a teaching gift. Just the the communication that's global. You may have the email that changes a nation. You may write a three-sentence email that ends up being put on the news some, some nation that actually changes the nation, and you might not ever preach a sermon on a microphone. Well, the baker was accused of poisoning the king's family, and the Lord told Bob in this experience, he says, the bakers, they're the ministries that are putting poison in the bread. And they're killing my family. And the Lord told Bob, this is what it means to have poison. It's a ministry, whether it's song, whether it's drama, whether it's writing, whether it's preaching. It's it's a ministry that does not produce humility. That is poison. Whatever ministry it is, if it doesn't produce humility, it is poison. That doesn't mean every sermon, every song has to be on humility. That's not the point. But it must, the overall impact of our ministry must not just produce inspiration for people to come to the next meeting, go to the next prayer meeting. It must contribute to producing humility in people's spirits. This is a very powerful revelation. The Lord said thunderous to me, audible voice. I have a revelation for you. This is what it is. Our singing, our interactions, our writings, our stage presentation, how we come and go. Everything about us, we want it to do it with a view of producing humility. Everything doesn't produce humility in the direct sense, but it doesn't get in the way of humility and produces humility. Those are the two concepts. Paragraph D. The Lord told Bob, he says, I'm going to exalt the cupbearer, from prison, and they're going to serve wine in the presence of the king. I'm going to exalt the cupbearer. There are cupbearers that have been in prison. They have been in a time of struggle. They've been in a divine constraint, a a season where they're hemmed in. They're in in a figurative sense, a prison season where they're constrained. The Lord said, I am going to liberate my servants out of prison, and I will exalt them, and they will serve wine in my presence again. And, of course, there's lots of applications for that. But here's the paragraph D, the, I mean, a very important point to me at that time. And the Lord told Bob Jones, he heard this in in just that face-to-face encounter in the Spirit. He said, tell them, and to me specifically, but tell them, it will begin in 10 years that I will exalt my cupbearers. They will serve wine. And the Lord told Bob that he's going to use this wine, this is an important point, to bring humility to the body of Christ. And I'm going to break that down in a minute. He's going to use the wine to bring humility because that's what's going to happen again. I've had four or five dreams in the last year or two that I believe were from the Lord, prophetic dreams, where the Lord has shown me he's going to pour wine out in our midst again, the wine of the Spirit. And I'm looking back to these lessons, and I remember the Lord said, I have a revelation for you, Mike. I have a revelation for you. You must hear this revelation. And I think it's related to this wine season that's yet ahead of us, as well as the whole of our future. This is not a small point. Paragraph E, the Lord was showing us that in his bigger picture, he's going to release wine first. Now, I would prefer the wind, the creative miracles, the building shaking, the whole city seized in power, the activity of angels manifest in the natural. I like the wind. How many of you like the wind? I like the fire. I mean, conviction, heart-wrenching repentance that frees and liberates the heart to touch God, and that deeply engaged, first commandment first, passionate commitment of devotion to love Him. 
for him to be our portion. How many of you like the fire? I like the fire anointing. If it's from the Lord, it's good. Well, the wine. The wine makes the heart happy. The wine of the Spirit brings joy and it heals. And it causes the Father's love to touch. I hadn't thought much about wine. I thought about fire and wind, 1984. The Lord says, I'm going to put wine. And the reason I'm choosing wine is to produce humility. I could never have understood what that was going to lead to. And I believe another season of wine, we're going to see it again. And we need to learn these lessons. Now, paragraph F, let's look at the, you know, some time passes and it strikes me. Lord, why didn't you just tell me directly? I mean, you talk, you're speaking audibly, thunderous, you're shaking my being. Why did I call another person? And the answer that became very clear in the days following He wants us to understand we need one another to receive the fullness. I cannot enter into the fullness for my life by just me and my dedication. I need to interact with you in your dedication for me to receive my fullness. Part of my fullness is in your hands. Part of your fullness is in my hands. And that's just not true of of people inside of one ministry Part of the IHOP fullness is in the hands of other ministries that we receive from them. They teach us and we learn and we serve them. We give to them, they give to us. Part of our fullness is in the hands of others. And the Lord even strategically withholds something from one ministry, gives an extra measure to another ministry. He does it strategically. So we have to go over to that other ministry, receive from them, and in the process of receiving from them, we fall in love with them. We would have never have taken time to interact with that other ministry, but we were so desperate to have the grace of God they have. We went over, took the time and the energy, and we ended up saying, hey, we like these guys and gals. We, and that's how love relationships are happening. So even as we're going forward in the power of the ministry, the Lord is going to, relieve, uh, uh, going to cause there to be many deficiencies in our midst on purpose. He wants us to reach across the lines and to receive the fullness from others. That was even a part of the humility message was the way that it came down. Paragraph G. Now these were the two things that were hard for me to understand. Or to receive, not understand. I understood them clearer. Number one, 10 years. Now I'm 54. 10 years, I know I can make 10 years. When I was 28... I'd only had my driver's license about 10 years. I mean, 10 years was another world. I went, when Bob Jones said 10 years, that was a death sentence. I go, in 10 years, I'll be almost 40. You'll be too late. I go, 10 years. Bob goes, well, that will be here in a minute. I go, "Ah, that is the most horrible word I can imagine. But the Lord wanted me to get a perspective that he's not just orchestrating how to have a little lively revival spirit for on our, in our ministry for a few years. The Lord is orchestrating his global end-time purposes that are going to result in the coming of Jesus and the transition to another age. He is operating on a strategic global level. And we must be receiving and serving in a dynamic interaction with ministries globally and understanding what he's saying from the council, the witness that God's giving the larger body of Christ. And he's going to give wine. That was the second thing instead of the fire. I was praying for fire. And he said, wine. I said, wine? He goes, yes. I'd never seen a meeting where, quote, the wine of the Spirit was poured out. I go, wine? Wine? You mean like Charles Finney, the power of God and thousands getting saved? Wine is what the Lord said. Read the book of Acts. See what wine is. They were happy. I was thinking more of being intense. Roman numeral four. Ten years later, the renewal of 1994. The renewal of 1994 was not just a blessing that happened in Toronto. And some of you that are younger won't know much about this. But those of you that have been around a while, it was a frontline news of the body of Christ for many years. And by the way, the Lord's still blessing and pouring out His Spirit in, in Toronto. 
doesn't have the global prominence it had for about five years, but the Lord's still moving and touching and meeting them. just want to say that. But the, what God did in Toronto, there's many lessons that affect our future. That's why I'm taking time on this. Just like uh, the lessons with the vineyard affect our future. As I talked in the last session. Because the, the Lord's pouring wine out on a global level. It's getting the body of Christ ready for fire. And I believe the fire was released in a measure... In Pensacola, there was a fire dimension. But all of these are just measures right now. They're, the measure is going to be far greater before the Lord returns in all of these dimensions. The reason the Lord released fire, I mean wine first, there's many reasons. But according to the revelation that God spoke to me and Bob Jones on that day, it was to produce humility in leaders so they would produce it in others. That was, it on, 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 that was on very few people's minds. When the wine was flowing, most people were just thinking of receiving and getting happy. The Lord had a very different agenda. It's to humble everyone across the line. The people that received it and believed it, and the people that resisted it, everybody was humbled when the wine was poured out. Because the agenda of God of pouring out His Spirit is not just happy meetings. It's not just even larger meetings and more people getting saved. Certainly people getting saved is the top of the list. But it's more than just an out, uh, an outreach and, wow, we're excited. He wants to produce mass humility in the body of Christ on a global scale. He has an agenda. And it's not necessarily the same agenda that we have when we cry out for revival. Often people are crying out for healing and power so the meetings are bigger, more exciting. And they do want Jesus being saved. But Jesus wants us to bear the cross. As the preacher said, the same God that orchestrated the crucifixion of Jesus is orchestrating your crucifixion right now. And what he meant by that is that he's going to see that we walk in humility. The people who live for humility, they're hard to to offend. They're stable. They're hard to offend. It's not only that we would be humble. That's not enough that we would be humble. He wants us to produce it in the new believers. He wants us to produce humility, not just have it, but actively produce it. This revelation told me, of course, it's clear enough in the Bible by itself, but when you have a revelation, the Lord is is focusing and putting more heightened focus on it. Beloved, here's the question of IHOP to our leadership team, to me, to all of us. Are we actively, in all that we're doing, trying to produce humility in the people that are receiving our songs, our dramas, our teachings, our writing. This is the Lord's agenda for the outpouring in terms of the body of Christ. And, of course, it's to relieve the oppressed and to win the loss and many other things. But at the core of it, it's to bring us into humility. Paragraph D, B, the spring of 94 the Lord poured out the wine of the Spirit in Toronto. And, of course, we know the names John Arnett and Randy Clark. And it started 10 years, just like Bob Jones. And people were talking, the wine of the Spirit. I'd never heard of the wine of the Spirit in 84. 10 years, the wine of the Spirit is on the front news of the body of Christ kind of attention, in the Western world at least. It's a very dynamic move. Paragraph C, one of the new expressions of Christianity. The Lord says, I'm going to change the expression of Christianity. There's a new expression. It's in our attitude of honoring Jesus. We have to cooperate with the Spirit. This is a a tough one. It seems simple, but this is one of the most challenging things. We can't neglect the wine when he pours it out. We can't resist it. See, some people, they don't resist it, but they just neglect it. They're, they're, they don't oppose it. They just say, I'm not that, I don't think much about it. But we can't exaggerate it either. We can't exaggerate it. We can't overdo it. We can't underdo it. We can't ignore it. Can't stand against it. He says, I want an attitude towards my spirit that honors what the Lord wants. Paragraph D. Now, top of page three. These, there are four groups that come to mind when I think of the outpouring of the Spirit. And the wine is the most offensive of the three. People don't have that much offense. Well, I guess they probably really do with the fire of conviction and, and repentance. Because if you repent, then your friend says, oh, you mean, are you implying I'm supposed to repent too? So I'm sure it has its problems. 
But the wine has a stigma to it that's God orchestrated. I mean, people are happy and falling over and flopping and kicking and all this strange things that are new. And undoubtedly, there's hamburger helper in some of it, but there's an authentic reality. There's an authentic reality in some of this as well. I mean, a lot of things that were very unorthodox were totally of the Lord. And I said, as I watched this, I did the math and I said, Lord, you're not out to hurt our pride. You're out to kill it. This, if we do this, it were over in terms of respectability. I get it. I can connect the dots. And the Lord is saying, I'm pouring out wine for this purpose. Now, I found four groups in the renewal. The people who resisted the wine because they were simply unfamiliar with it. They had never seen it, so they were against it because they'd never seen it. That's not a good enough reason. Humility will answer that. The next group, they resisted it because it didn't start with them. Because they had to go a couple miles down the road to get it from another ministry. They said, "Uh uh-uh. We believe it, but no, nah, we're not going to have our people touch another ministry. The Lord says that doesn't work either. Humility can fix that one. Well, the anointed guys and gals, they were attacked everywhere. They go, Lord, we're being faithful. We're being attacked everywhere with false accusations and all kinds of things. The, Lord, the Lord's answer is, well, humility will fix that one too. And then there were those that exaggerated it. That on a scale of 1 to 10, what happened to a 2? They made it out to be a four and a six and an eight. And there's a reproach that goes with that as well. Humility fixes all of these. And there's a couple other categories you could put in there. Paragraph E, the category I'm most concerned about is the bearing of the stigma of the wine. And because we haven't seen that much activity of the Spirit compared to what's going to happen in the future... We think of the activity of the Spirit mostly, again, as exciting, not as a reproach, but more as an excitement. And the truth is it's both. It's exciting and it's a reproach. But we have to be sober about the reproach. And the next thing, it's not just the bearing of the reproach, it's the attitude of lowliness when the Lord puts something in your hand. The attitude of humility when the Lord gives you a little bit. What we do with that extra that He gives us. 1 Corinthians 4, I have it on the notes, verse 9. Here's Paul the Apostle speaking. God has displayed us, apostles, he's displayed us as last. One translation says God put us in the showcase. He put us in the showcase, the store window, and people came by and gawked at us. He put us on open display as looking last. He's talking about in honor, last in honor. When the people saw the apostles, we read the book of Acts and we go, wow. But in their day, they were displayed, not by the devil, by God. They were displayed as last. We have been made a spectacle. Even the angels look at us and go, wow. That's intense what they're going through. I don't know what that means exactly. That an angel would be a spectacle to angels. But even the angels see the dedication of the apostles, the way that they're reproached. And rejected. I mean, they rejected the Messiah when he came in power and wisdom and dignity. He says, we're fools. We're weak. We're dishonored. We're reviled. We're persecuted. Beloved, we are dreaming of an anointing where we're first. We're not a spectacle. We're honored. We're not fools. But we look wise to everyone. We don't look weak, we we look strong. We don't look dishonored, we look honored. We're talked about positive, not reviled. Beloved, that's, that's the wrong image. When these promises unfold, there will be a stigma if we're faithful to them, and we will be by the grace of God. But then there will also be an attitude of humility that even those that don't back, of the sti- back away from the stigma, they don't have a generosity of spirit towards others in the body of Christ that are different, and especially others in the body of Christ that resisted them. The Lord says, I require humility straight across the line, or you're going to lose or diminish the promises. That's why I'm saying I'm... I know I'm giving a little bit of a teaching, and I don't want to do that in these eight sessions. I just want to give the stories. But all of these eight 
one-hour sessions of testimony will be lost or diminished on this issue. The Lord said, by thun like thunder, I have a revelation for you, Mike Bickle. I have a revelation for you. Call Bob Jones. And Bob Jones says, if it doesn't produce humility, the wine is going to produce humility. And if it doesn't produce humility, it's going to poison the body of Christ, my family. And I look across the body of Christ and so much that is being honored and displayed and promoted does not produce humility. That's not my business to go figure that part out. It's my business to say it doesn't matter how it goes down in the public arena. We must stand for what the Holy Spirit's saying and doing, and we must have a generous spirit towards everyone that's friendly to give them what we have and to those that are opposing to serve them in all ways possible without drawing attention to the fact we're doing it. The Lord says, now I'll give power into that kind of community. I'm very grateful for John Arnott and many others that took a courageous stand. I mean, I just saw the reproach they took. I think we will be surprised how many fear of man issues are going to surface when the wind, fire, and wine begin to manifest at a new level. I mean, fear of man issues in us. Because the Lord's going to display us. He's going to put us on display. And it's not the Lord is going to exhibit us. All that he anoints, he's going to put them on display as last. And that is not the American dream. That's not a Western paradigm. That is not something the body of Christ is excited about being put on display as last. We're praying and fasting with the anointing to be first. The Lord says, I'm praying, you're praying and fasting, I'm going to anoint you to make you last. This is where it's going. Let's go to the top of page four. I won't s- just spend a moment on this. And this will be a shorter session than the other ones. Because I, I, wanted to do, I wanted to pause from these glorious kind of... Some of the stories have a spectacular element. Some are kind of mystical and perplexing element. And I wanted to, right in the middle of these eight one-hour sessions, just to lock in and say, let's have a reality check. Do we really want these things to happen? Of course, the answer is yes, but not just excitement. Bear the stigma and a spirit of honor and servanthood. Roman numeral five. We'll just take a minute on this. I won't go long on this. God wants to establish a culture of honor. This is what the Holy Spirit really wants to do. We love God by honoring everybody that he calls, everyone that's dear to him. All the different streams, denominations, tribes in the body of Christ that do, they approach the ministry different, they look different, they express it different. The Lord says, they're dear to me. Don't write them off. They're dear to me. I want them honored. He requires that we dwell together in a culture of honor. And I don't mean just among each other, that we honor the ministries that we live with. That, that's very important. That's very important. I'm talking about we honor the ministries in our city, in our nation, and the nations that do it differently than we do. And that don't appreciate us. We honor them. We bless when we're reviled. The Holy Spirit insists on this if we're going to be those that walk in the greater dimensions of the Spirit. God loves the whole body of Christ, and He wants us to. Jesus loves the whole body of Christ. Imagine that concept. He loves the whole church. And at the core of our community and everybody that believes for the greater breakthrough, we must love the whole church, not just the ones that look like us. Baptists, Nazarenes, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Episcopals, Catholics. I'm talking about born-again Catholics. There's millions of them that are born. Salvation by faith. They've born again. They typically use the word spirit-filled. But they're connected to Jesus. Millions of them. All kinds of non-denomination. And now here's why I'm saying this. Think about it. In this Joseph's dungeon, the one I just looked at a minute ago, I have a revelation for you. Humility, thunderous voice of God. And the one we shared in the last uh, 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 session, session three. Right now we're on session four. The control spirit. When I'm in Cardiff, Wales, and the Lord says, you must relinquish all rights. 
No one with a controlled spirit. You cannot possess the blessing of God for yourself. When I give you the blessing of God, you must think of ways to give it away free. Well, come join us. The Lord says, no, no, not give it away so they join you. You have to possess the kingdom without a controlled spirit. The money, the blessing, the honor. We must, it's this, this thing I insist on. Anybody can recruit from us. Anytime they want our copyrights, the right to copy. And it's more than that. We need to be thinking of ways where we can make other ministries successful without it ever coming back to bless us in a way consciously. I'm talking about giving them time, people, and money with no way that it comes back and makes us better, bigger. Just doing it because God loves the church. We just leave it there. Well, they'll never come back and bless us. If we put a lot of time and energy, it will never make IHOP bigger. And the Lord says, perfect. That's called the kingdom of God. Well, they're different from us and they're not really doing our thing. Perfect. Serve them. That's called the kingdom of God. This is what the Lord's saying. Paragraph C, there's many. The body of Christ, we have, we agree on the main and plain things of the faith, but we have many differences. We agree on salvation by faith, the authority of the scripture. We agree on the two great commandments. We agree on evangelizing the lost. We agree on the need to transform city and the mandate to do it and disciple nations, but many other things are different. The Lord says, if you agree on those main and plain things, you can honor one another. Open your heart to each other. If we think, secretly think, we're a little better or a little more dedicated, it will feed a spirit of pride. If any of us think we're a little more dedicated, you know, that group down the road, they don't do what we do and they don't do it like we do it. The Lord says, don't go there. Don't don't even go there. It's critical. If you're going to operate in the healing, anointing, the authority of the spirit of these great breakthroughs of power, we must have a heart response that is in line with the Holy Spirit who's releasing the power. Paragraph E. Elitism or humility can be imparted. We can impart humility to our students or we can impart elitism to them. The young people, they're like wet cement. They will follow the spirit, the tone, and the style of what their leaders do consistently. And I'm saying... Us here and others abroad that we're connected with, we are consciously wanting to impart humility. Consciously wanting to impart it. It's not something that just, if it happens, that's cool. The Lord said, I have a revelation for you. Thundered from heaven. You better get this one. Well, we want this church to know how special our prophecies are. How great our promises are. The Lord says, don't just impart that. That's all you impart. Your history is going to be cut short. The last thing I want is these eight sessions and we walk away. We got great promises. We got dedicated people. We're awesome. Oh, sorry, friend. You guys must be left out. That would be the most grievous thing imaginable, celebrating all the great things God is saying about our future. We have to know that the Lord is requiring a spirit of humility in all this. Three simple principles. We bless without criticism. Paragraph G, we bless the budding virtues in other ministries that have not yet matured. We bless them. Yes, they have deficiencies. Yes, we have differences. We bless all ministries that we have the agreement on the main and plain things of salvation. Yeah, but they don't have teaching. They don't do the prayer. They don't do the outreach. They don't do the human, I I, I mean, the youth ministry. They don't have the this or that. The Lord says they all have deficiencies. IHOP has many deficiencies. You don't just bless the group with no deficiencies. You bless everybody if they love Jesus. Well, they're different in style and focus. They push people down in the prayer lines. We don't. You better not. Not here. They do it down the way. That's their business. We'll bless them. We don't have to point out the differences. Now, in this house, you can't do it. Lord says, you don't talk about that. The Holy Spirit has forbidden us as a community to put down other ministries because of their deficiencies or differences. And if we do, I've I've insisted on this, you must confess it as sin to the people you did it to. Any of our leaders put down another ministry. Well, you know those other guys. 
I'm talking about a put down. We can't do it based on their deficiencies or their differences. The Holy Spirit is forbidden us. We must bless. We must have a, cult, a culture of honor. Paragraph H. It's more than a blessing. Inclusion. This is what I was referring to a minute ago. We have to understand. When we understand God's value for other people, then we see those people differently. I talk about other ministries. We set our heart. We're going to say, Lord, we're going to use our resources to make them more successful without an ever trickling back to us. Now, in God's kingdom, he always makes it come back. But that's up to him. I'm talking about there's no agenda. We're not talking at their conference so they will join us. That's not the point. We're going to their conference because we want to strengthen who they are, not lead them back to us. We want to give them money, not so they will come to us so that they're stronger. We want to bless them with no context that they're coming back to us. And the Lord wants us to think of ways to bless the other churches and ministries with none of it coming back. But paragraph, principle number three, we've got to be loyal to truth as well. Because there are, in the context of blessing, uh, some folks go strong on blessing, but they come up short on this. And again, that's between them and God. But in our house here, we want to be loyal to truth. Because there are destructive doctrines, and there are destructive behaviors, and those need to be addressed, but they need to be addressed in the right process, in the right spirit. So I'm ending with that. I realize I didn't tell you. I got a bunch more stories. But I have the fear of the Lord on me right now. I'm thinking we're at this 10-year mark. And we're saying yes to these stories. And I just feel the Holy Spirit like brooding over saying yes. You've said yes to the stories. What about the stigma? And what about the attitude of servanthood and humility? What, do you, what about that? No, Lord, we got power and lightning strike and massive numbers and waves of glory and worship and stadiums filled and processions down the road. And yes! Life is going to be great and fun. Or says, well, it's, it's going to have some joy in it, but it's going to be a lot different than you think when it happens. Let he that has ears hear what the Spirit's saying. Amen. And amen. God bless you.